Well, we're here to celebrate Charles Darwin, arguably the greatest scientist ever, certainly the greatest non-mathematical scientist ever. It's a very happy choice to invite a distinguished physicist to honor Darwin, because in Darwin's own time, he was given a hard time by distinguished physicists. Uh, there was Fleming Jenkin, the engineer, who uh, proved that natural selection was impossible because all the variation in the population would simply disappear as the generations went by. It seems to have escaped his notice that actually the variation does not disappear as the generations go by. Then there was the more formidable challenge from Lord Kelvin, who might have been the most distinguished physicist of his time, uh, who argued that uh, evolution couldn't have happened because the sun was too young. Um, and he was a thorn in Darwin's side. Darwin was very worried by this because physics was regarded as the sort of senior science. Um, it was, incidentally, it was Kelvin who also who said the following three memorable predictions. Radio has no future. <laughs> Heavier than air, flying machines are impossible. X-rays will prove to be a hoax. <laughs> Gratifyingly, it was Darwin's son George, Sir George, for George Darwin was knighted, unlike his father, Sir so George Darwin, who eventually showed where Kelvin went wrong, uh, using nuclear physics as opposed to classical physics. But even before George Darwin answered Kelvin, Darwin should have said something like this. You say that physics doesn't allow enough time for evolution to occur, so my biology must be wrong. But my biology shows that evolution has occurred so your physics must be wrong. <laughs> How very different is the physicist whom it's my privilege to introduce today. He's not only a world expert in theoretical physics and cosmology, he knows a lot of biology too. His origins project at, in Arizona sweeps across the gamut of origins, the origin of the universe, the origin of the laws of physics, the origin of life, the origin of chemistry, the origin of humanity, the origin of language, the origin of culture. And he's a brilliant communicator, as we're about to discover. If you were looking for a professor of the public understanding of science, which is the office I recently held at Oxford, you couldn't do better than to choose Lawrence Krauss. But there's a more particular reason, I think, why, of all physicists, Lawrence Krauss is an especially happy choice for Darwin's day. Darwin's greatest achievement was to demonstrate a powerful way in which big, complex things can come from small, simple things without the need for intervention by a divine spook. Theologians, as a consequence of Darwin, have retired hurt from the field of biology. They've retreated to the field of physics, taken refuge in questions about the origin of all things. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is the universe there at all? How did everything start? The origin of matter, energy, the laws of physics. They've retreated there only to find Lawrence Krauss waiting for them. <laughs> With his audacious demonstration that even more dramatically than Darwin, perhaps, a universe can spring spontaneously from nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, my very good friend, Lawrence Krauss. Thank you very much. Can you hear me with this microphone? Good. I told Richard he wouldn't want to sit up here because he'd, everyone would be looking at him the whole time. Um, it is a great honor for me to be here. I really mean that, and I appreciate all of the... I'm overwhelmed by the interest uh, in, in this, and I know it's because Richard was here, but I, I'm happy that... Um, you know, I, I, 
I have prepared a lecture specifically for this day because uh, it is Darwin Day. And um, there we go. Uh, and I was, as I was reading my new book, I realized it's kind of appropriate. Obviously, my last book, is, as Richard said, was, was somewhat appropriate. And I do, I'm going to do a few things I never do, which I'm going to read a little bit from the book. I, I take this from Richard because I've been at lectures where he's read a little bit from his book. I love listening to him read his books. Um, I don't love listening to me read my books, but nevertheless, I noticed in page two of my book, I, I say, what cosmic arrogance lies at the heart of the assertion that the universe was created so that we could exist? What myopia lies at the heart of the assumption that the universe of our experience is characteristic of the universe throughout all of space and time? And that's the idea, in some sense, that, that Darwin first challenged, the notion that that what we see now is the way it always was and the way it always will be. The whole point of evolution, in fact, was to point out that that's not the case. And, and physics, as Richard pointed out, has, has, uh, has taken up that gauntlet in some sense. Uh, and so I want to I w- I talk a little bit about that in the context of, of Darwin and, and not just describe, well, I'll describe a number of aspects of, of cosmic natural selection, how, we've, how the ideas that Darwin developed are useful in the context of science and, and hopefully um, give you a different view of the universe we live in. This is, uh, this is a version of the universe we live in uh, as seen on a cold day, a little colder than today, uh, but nevertheless cold. And, and I want to point out that it's not just beautiful, but it is so beautiful that you might begin to think that these wonderful things were designed because they look so nice. And it's one of the things that, that, that I encounter a lot, as Richard does, the notion that the universe is too beautiful not to have been designed. But the other thing I want to point out is that we're fortunate to be able to look at it from the outside. But imagine what it would be like to live on one of these icicles, these ice crystals. Okay? If you lived on that ice crystal, the world would be very different to you. Scientists, physicists in particular, who, as Richard pointed out, are often wrong, uh, would would recognize that, well, if you say you lived on that ice crystal there, there'd be something very special about that direction. And the laws of physics would, in fact, say that that direction is different. It'd be very different to move along that direction than perpendicular. The forces would be different along that direction than that other direction. That would be part of your universe. That would just be the way things are. And in fact, that direction would be so important that there'd be religions based on that direction. Okay, there'd be people killing each other because that direction was more important than other directions. And what we can see, of course, is that's myopic. That's just an accident of the existence of those individuals. And I want to show you how that's exactly true, not just approximately true, but the world that we take for granted, the physics that we take for granted, is in some sense an illusion, an accident of our existence, in the same sense that, that... our existence here as biological creatures is an accident of our existence. And this notion that everything is perfectly designed for us, which was so prevalent when, when Darwin first overcame it, and it's so hard for people to overcome, is still characteristic. I hear that about the universe in so many ways. It's just perfect for us. But it's that illusion of design is something that he overcame, and I want to try and show you how we've overcome it in science. So. Um, The illusion of, just before I was coming here, I get a lot of email, and someone (coughs) sent me this this, uh, cartoon, which was supposed to tell me why I was wrong, atheist logic. This building is a marvel of architectural design. This painting shows a mastery of technique. This engine is a real piece of sophisticated engineering. Clearly no one made any of this. That's the kind of stuff. And so the universe appears to be more complicated than any of these things in principle, so how could it not have been made? The illusion of design is prevalent, it will continue, and as I was just saying when I was answering someone here, that the, 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 the whole point of evolution, and in fact the point of physics, as I'll show you, is not that the universe was designed for us, but it is fine-tuned for our existence, but we're fine-tuned to exist in the universe, and that's a very different thing. So, to give you an example, here are our Christmas ornaments which are clearly designed, but they're not Christmas ornaments, they're, they're snowflakes. And it's just the laws of chemistry, which of course is physics, as is biology. Uh, <laughs> just the fact that polar molecules happen, if you put polar molecules together and the laws of electricity, magnetism, uh, and quantum mechanics, you'll get snowflakes. There's no design there, they're just beautiful. 
The many people say, well, as you saw in that image, it, you can clearly see, you know, a car is designed. So you can see sort of human things that are designed. Here's a here's a dome from that clearly was designed by Buckminster Fuller, and it's true. It was designed by Buckminster Fuller. And so clearly that's evidence of, of design. But of course, nature in soot has Buckminster Fullerene, carbon 60, which is an exactly the same thing. I and mean, you can't get less designed than soot. Okay? So we have to be very skeptical and careful to question ourselves. When we see something that looks like it's designed, we should step back and ask the question, how do we know that? And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today, because of him. So he developed the theory of evolution. I want to point out that you know people people have very different notions of evolution, and I, and 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 I'm always surprised how even people that accept the idea of evolution don't really understand it, and that's okay because it's, if you're going to accept anything, evolution is better than God. But but uh, uh, the, the, what's really important in evolution is even if, is, is this is the picture of evolution that we tend to see in most things, this linear development. And then, of course, people come and say, well, if, as they often say, if humans develop from apes, how come they're still apes? And of course, that misrepresents the idea that the key part of evolution is natural selection. It's the fact that there are not only diversity within a population, but diversity of species. And so that there is no way a linear uh, heritage, which of course is central, that certain species are selected over time, and, and, and their ancestors could be a variety of different species. The, I, so this notion that evolution could take place requires a diversity of popu in the population, in the frequency of genes in a population. It also requires an often a population. And that's a key factor. Because 100 years ago, less than 100 years ago, it's really kind of amazing. There are people here who are probably old enough to, to, to may not be, remember this, but to have been around when this was the case. In 1925, anyone here older than that? <laughs> there may be some. Just checking. Okay. <laughs> I feel older than that. But anyway, uh, in 1925, the universe consisted of one galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy, surrounded by an eternal empty space that had been around forever. That was the consensus in science. And of course, that's changed. We now know there are over 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe, and the universe had a beginning. But that's a key factor, because this is the universe in which we live. And that already sets the stage for cosmic natural selection. There isn't just one galaxy. There are 100 billion galaxies. It's a Hubble Space Telescope image, and every dot in this image is a galaxy, not a star. Each of them containing up to 100 billion or over 100 billion stars. In some cases, the most distant objects here are are uh, probably nine or ten billion light years away, which means that the light from them took nine or ten billion years to get here, which means since our sun is four and a half billion years old, well, in Washington it's 6,000 years old right now, but, in, but in, <laughs> it's four and a half billion years old, that means that the light from these stars left before our Earth and sun formed. And since our sun will last about ten billion years, that means many of the stars in this image no longer exist. They're gone. and the, and the concerns of the civilization around those stars are gone. No one ever knows they'll have existed, just like if a picture of us was taken right now, or, and the light eventually went to a, a new star being born in one of these galaxies, and a civilization around that new star evolving, as they would if life exists on those, on those planets. They would see that light nine billion years later, and our sun will have died out. All evidence of our existence will have gone. All evidence of Donald Trump will have gone. All concerns about Brexit will have been gone. And so the point is, it doesn't really matter. Okay? This too shall pass. But the point that there's so many galaxies opens up the possibility of cosmic natural selection. If you say, if the Earth is the only planet in the universe, then, boy, then it seems like it's special. But we now know that every star in our galaxy has planets around it. Wide diversity of planets. And then you say, well, the Earth exists just in the right place. And that's true. It does. But then if you ask, why do we live on Earth, the answer is quite obvious. We live on Earth because we couldn't live anywhere else. We wouldn't have evolved anywhere else. So we live where we can live. It's it would be very exciting if we could live where we couldn't live. That would be another book. But it's not the case. No one would be around to read it. So it wouldn't sell. OK. <laughs> So, the, the, the other notion, and, and I'll just remind you briefly, because I don't want to spend too much time on the universe from nothing, is that, okay, so in our universe there's a great diversity of galaxies and diversity of planets. Already we can begin to see the idea that there might be a cosmic natural selection. 
But as I pointed out in the, in the last book, what we also know is that empty space is not so empty. This is, an, this is actually a calculation of what the empty space, in this case, empty space inside of a proton looks like. It's a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence every instant. And most of the mass of your body is in fact due to these virtual particles that aren't there, that you can't see. If you look inside a proton, you wouldn't be able to measure them. The laws of quantum mechanics, which I'll talk about in a little bit, allow that to be the case. But once we apply quantum mechanics, which allows particles to pop in and out of existence, well, certainly empty space is no longer empty. That kind of nothing is not nothing. And people get upset when I say universe from nothing because they say, well, you're not talking about nothing. And what I point out, first of all, I point out that some people are experts at nothing. But secondly, that the notions of nothing have changed. And that's OK. That's OK. That's what we call learning. It's all right to have redefined the idea of nothing. Empty space is not nothing. But even no space may not be nothing. Because if you apply the laws of quantum mechanics to space and time, which would be a quantum theory of general relativity, of gravity, which we think must exist, although we don't have such a theory, then space and time become quantum mechanical variables. And spaces and times can pop into existence. Whole universes can pop into existence from nothing. And in fact, if you ask what can happen, well, there can be many, i can go back to this one. We actually, our theories of the early universe suggest that that's exactly what happens. That whole universes do pop into existence from nothing. And moreover, the laws of physics could easily be different in each universe. And in some universes, there'd be many galaxies. Other universes would not quite have galaxies. And other universes would have no galaxies at all. Where would we expect to find ourselves? We would find ourselves in a universe with galaxies. Cosmic natural selection. So, there's little doubt that all of the, uh, all of the details necessary to understand why our, why our universe seems so finely tuned to us is an illusion. That we are finely tuned to our universe because we could evolve in our universe. If we could evolve in another universe, then the characteristics of that universe would appear to be finely tuned to us. It's just a simple putting on its head what Dar Charles Darwin did for life. Okay? And I could end that, this lecture there, but I'm not going to because well, maybe I should, but uh, um, because what I want to talk to you about today is really the context of, uh, of the new book I've written, which is really that even our universe is not finely tuned for life. It's not designed for us in a fundamental way that we've discovered that really represents when you ask the question, why are we here, there is no reason. It's an accident, an accident we should enjoy, but an accident. And so that's what I want to spend much of the rest of the lecture talking about. OK, this is what I said, by the way, here. I forgot to put it. But, but the, the idea that there may be many universes says that, the, for example, if the energy of empty space can vary in each one, then only in those when it's not much greater, for example, than what in the universe in we live, can galaxies form, and only then will stars and planets form, and only then will astronomers form. So the universe is the way it is, because astronomers are here. That sounds religious, but it's not. It's cosmic natural selection. But I want to go back to this guy here. I have many different pictures of Darwin, the young and old. Everyone seemed to have a beard to be sage. For a little while, I had a beard. It didn't work. But um, what, what I want to point out is that, is that quote I gave from that beautiful naturalist book, The Peregrine. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's a delightful book. The, the hardest thing of all to see is that which is really there. And that's what Darwin really did, was to see underneath the surface of what's obvious to understand what's really there. That's what science is all about. And I want to make a connection now between the, the biologist and, in this case, a philosopher. You, you see they all have beards. Um, and, and you're a British audience, so you should know who this is. But I won't ask you, because you'll all say Aristotle, which is some reason. Because that's everyone's favorite philosopher. But it's Plato, who's, a, who's maybe a less good philosopher. But I like him, because he d wrote one book I like, which I was forced to read in high school, because I grew up in Canada and I was educated. Um, <laughs> the the uh, the, uh, the, um, but in any case, um, the, the Republic, and, and there's a, one part of the Republic which is particularly useful, which is the allegory of the cave, which really captures for me what Darwin was all about and what modern science is all about. So I want to just remind you of it a little bit. And when I thought about this, I went back to my high school textbook. And this is the image I found from my high school textbook, which is old enough now not to have copyright protection, so I can, I can actually. But so he imagined, likened life, us, our existence, to 
people who are imprisoned in a cave who are chained and can only see the walls of the cave, the back wall of the cave, and there's a fire behind them, and they can see the shadows of reality of people walking on this roadway. And even further out is the real world with sunlight, and they can see shadows. And he said the job of the philosopher, scientist, mathematician is to somehow infer from the shadows what the reality is. And he said, not only would it be hard, but if, in fact, if you drag someone out to the sunlight here to see the real universe, the first thing that would happen is it would be terrifying. It would be difficult, it would be blinding, it would be uncomfortable. And then once you got used to the light and you saw what was really there, you wouldn't want to go back first. Secondly, if you did go back and tried to explain what you saw, everyone would think you're crazy. And as a, as a physicist, I, I know that feeling a lot. The, uh, it's because it, there's a huge leap between where we're at and what we experience. And for many people, that wall seems impenetrable. And I want to try and show you it isn't. This, by the way, dates my book because you can see in this case, this image is from the 1950s. So the, the people who are chained here are scantily clad young women, which um, is a 1950s thing. If it had been Plato's time, it would have been young boys. But, um, <laughs> Which, I'm sorry, but it would have been. Um, <laughs> but let's imagine what, would, what a philosopher or mathematician would see and, and some of the illusions that that person would have. So, for example, on the wall, they might see the shadow of a ruler, of a plastic ruler, the shadow on a wall. And what they would say is that length has no meaning. Length that we, you know, we know length has meaning. I can see this pointer, and it's, it's maybe 10 centimeters across. It has meaning. Length has meaning for us. But for these people, length wouldn't have meaning. Because later on in the day, it would look like that. And objects would arbitrarily change their length. And so it wouldn't be a concept that would be useful to those people. But the philosopher mathematician would say, who I'll now call a scientist, which is a higher level, would say, well, maybe, maybe they re length really does have a meaning. And maybe we're only seeing the shadows of reality. And maybe, in fact, these are shadows, two-dimensional images of a world that's really three-dimensional. So how could this be the case? If I, if I was hot, tall enough, I could do this, but I can't. So I'll just, I've drawn an image. But so let's say they'd imagine, well, the, re the light rays are coming. And if the ruler is parallel to the wall, we get a shadow that's this long. But if I rotate the ruler in an extra dimension that I'm going to posit exists, then the projection of that ruler on the wall will be smaller. You can try that. I don't know if I can project my, well, you can't. But anyway, try it at home. Okay, so if, I, if the ruler's rotated, then everything works. And then in the real universe, length has some meaning. There's continuity. There's an understanding, but it would imply the universe has an extra dimension. What a remarkable leap in understanding that would be of the illusion of reality to understand, as Darwin did, how things which seem so different on the surface can really be different manifestations of the same thing, that simple beginning that Richard talked about and that Darwin posited for the diversity of life. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to it. Because I want to jump to two scientists who were contemporaries of Darwin, two other great British scientists who were physicists, and in this case, they were right. Um, although Lord Kelvin did the best he could with the physics he had at the time. You know this is Michael Faraday, who is one of my heroes. He's the greatest experimental physicist of the 19th century, certainly. A uh, bookbinder's apprentice. He had no formal education. And, um, uh, uh, and he, uh, he created a tradition which I tell stu my students all about, which is really important, which is to always suck up to your professors because <laughs> it works. So he, he had no formal education. He, he, he attended the lectures of Humphrey Davy, who was ha the head of the Royal Institution at the time. and he took beautiful notes and bound them together in a beautiful volume, which he then presented to Humphrey Davy and said, can I be your assistant? And of course, professors are subject to flattery. After all, ego is all we have. And, and, uh, and so he said yes. And um, then, of course, Faraday rose to the ranks to become director of the Royal Institution and became and, and created everything, essentially, that is in this room now. The, we wouldn't be able to have this lecture if it weren't for the discoveries that Faraday made about electricity and magnetism. And he used to, he, in his laboratory, uh, there's a, a number of apocryphal stories that all I'm sure are not true, but I'll repeat, at least in any case, that, that you know, it's said that, say, Gladstone came into his laboratory 
and, and looked at all these jumping frogs and spinning wheels and sparks and other things and said, you know, of what use is any of this? And there, I've heard two different answers. One famous answer is Faraday is supposed to have said, of what use is a newborn baby? Um, which, of course, I guess as a parent, I, I've often said when... when anyway. Um, <laughs> but the more interesting answer is he said, of what use? This is so important that one day you will tax us for it. Okay? And he was right, because we get taxed for the power we use, because it was the laws of electricity and magnetism that Faraday discovered that led to electric power, that led to lights, that led to everything we have. And he discovered um, what he did by accident. Now, the first thing he did was something that Newton didn't even do. Okay? Newton tried, didn't answer the question, why does the Earth fall towards the sun? How does it know where the sun is? And as Newton, in his typical way, he said, I, I, hypothesis non fingo, I frame no hypotheses. It just is. Okay? But Faraday didn't have any mathematical background, and he, he said he, he only produced one equation in his life that he ever used. So he thought in pictures, and it was a mental crutch that he used to understand the universe. So he started to think, well, with two electric charges, how does one charge know to be repelled by another charge? And he imagined a picture, it was just pure uh, crutch that he used. He said, let me imagine around a charge that there are lines that go out of that charge radially, and the number of lines depends upon the strength of the charge. The more charge, the num greater the number of lines. And I'll call these field lines and say that around a charge is an electric field. Just something that I'll vent for myself, and then I can understand why another charge will be repelled, because it'll be repelled in the direction of the field lines. If it's here, it'll be repelled in that direction. If it's here, it'll be repelled in that direction. And the strength of the force repelling it will depend upon how many field lines there are. And this reproduced exactly the algebra that he wasn't comfortable with. In fact, it was even better. If you point out that field lines don't cross, then you could actually draw these nice pictures of the field lines around charges. And this reproduces not just approximately, but exactly the algebra of the electric force. So we know if I put a positive charge there, it'll be repelled in that direction. One here will be repelled in that direction. And the strength of the force will be greater there than there because there are more field lines. Great. That mental crutch created this just idea that would help him. But then he discovered, as often happens by accident, the law that changed everything. People had known that charges flowing will produce magnets. That had been discovered by the French physicists who did most of the good work before the English took over. And anyway. Um, <laughs> and so a, current, a charge current flowing will make a magnet. You've all played with electromagnets at some point in your life. Well, that means electric charges can create a magnetic field, can create mag forces on other magnets. If I move a charge, it creates a magnet, which produces a force on another magnet. So people wondered, well, there's some relationship between magnetism and electricity now. They're very different on the surface, but there's clearly some relationship. How good is the relationship? And people said, well, if an electric charge can create a magnetic field, can a magnet create a force on an electric charge? And so people brought magnets next to charges, really strong magnets. Nothing happened. And then what he discovered by accident was he had a wire that he was ready to set up to a current to make a magnet here. And he had another wire here. And when he turned on the current in this wire, suddenly a current would flow in the other wire. What he discovered was a changing magnetic field, in the language he would have used, a changing magnetic field produces an electric field because it causes charge to move. So a changing magnetic field actually produces an electric field. That was the crucial result because that allowed changing magnetic fields to indeed produce electric fields, which produced motors and electric power, which is taxed nowadays. Now, he didn't get it exactly right. The guy who got it exactly right was another bearded fellow, James Clerk Maxwell, who was the greatest theoretical physicist of the 19th century. And his story is also quite interesting because he, he, he was brilliant. He also died young. Uh, and he was a brilliant Scottish physicist and, and had done a new, numerous wonderful things when he was a young man, so wonderful that you'd think he would get a professorship. He had one for a while in Glasgow, but the, they merged two universities together. And in one of those typical academic decisions, they got rid of him and kept the other guy who no one has ever heard of. And, um, and then he tried to get a job in Edinburgh. Same thing happened. So he was relegated and exiled down to Cambridge, and, um, <laughs> where he hung for a while. And then eventually was able to go back. But he was a brilliant mathematician. And he put on a firm mathematical footing 
the discovery that Faraday had made. And he added, he fixed up the equations so they worked just right. And he realized something, the best calculation you can do in undergraduate physics, the most amazing calculation. He said, okay, if I have an electric charge and I move it up and down, then there's a current flowing, but the current is changing. So the current flowing will produce a magnetic field around it. But if the current is changing, the magnetic field will itself be changing. But if I have a changing magnetic field, I know that produces an electric field. But if the magnetic field is constantly changing, then the electric field is constantly changing. But if the electric field is constantly changing, then it produces a magnetic field here. It's constantly changing, an electric field, magnetic field. If I shake a charge, I will produce a disturbance in electric and magnetic fields, which will move out as a wave. And the really wonderful thing he was able to show, and this is the beautiful calculation I wish everyone would do at one point in their life, because it's amazing, is he showed that if you measure the strength of the force between two electric charges in the laboratory, some number, I measure the strength of the force between two magnets in the laboratory, those are two experimental numbers I can measure, then I can predict the speed of this disturbance. He plugged it in, and what did he discover? It was the speed of light. He discovered that light was an electromagnetic wave. Which had been, people had known that light was a wave for a long time, but what was a wave of? Now we know it's a disturbance of electric and magnetic fields, which aren't mental crutches. That's the amazing thing. Faraday had invented them to help himself, but they're as real as anything, they're as real as anything before your eyes because they are what's before your eyes. You couldn't see if it weren't these changing electric and magnetic fields that we call light. And that beautiful result unified electricity and magnetism, completely showed something remarkable, that one person's electricity is another person's magnetism. That if I measure an electric field, someone moving with respect to me will measure the same thing and call it a magnetic field. That what you call it depends upon the accident of your circumstances. A characteristic which in some sense is, again, central to the idea of evolution, the accident of our circumstances, what we think is natural. It just happens to be the world we live in now. It won't be the same in the future. It wasn't the same in the past. And I liken this light, in some sense, the simplification of what light is, is as central to physics as evolution is to biology, because it makes everything understandable, and it simplifies everything. This first unification was beautiful. And the, the, the signal of progress in science is that things which appear to be different are seen to be different manifestations of the same thing. Whenever that happens, you know you've made progress. And this was the first great bit of progress in modern science, the unification of electricity and magnetism. But you're going to see it, it leads us ultimately to a new understanding of our own cosmic natural selection. You know who this guy is, Einstein. Einstein created problems for all of us who are physicists. Um, it's certainly for me, I get lots of letters. Actually, I get emails now, which is a lot easier because they're a lot easier to, to delete. But, but um, <laughs> they, uh, so I, I, you've got to check this careful flaw of logic. I get emails from people who tell me, everything you think is wrong. I mean, I get emails and political emails in that regard too, but, but everything you physicists think is wrong. And let me tell you, Everyone thinks I'm crazy, but everyone thought Einstein was crazy. Therefore, <laughs> okay, what they don't understand is that's the biggest misrepresentation of science. People think scientific revolutions do away with what went before them. They don't. They do exactly the opposite, because what has survived the test of experiment will always survive the test of experiment. So if you have a theory that explains some experiment, it's not, it'll never be wrong. Newton will never be wrong. The motion of cricket balls, if you have the patience to watch, uh, <laughs> is described by Newton's laws. It will be described by Newton's laws even when we understand quantum gravity, if we ever do. Nothing that we will discover in modern physics will change the fact that Newton's laws are appropriate to describe the motion of baseballs or cannonballs or cricket balls. Okay? And what the brilliance of Einstein was to realize that, of course, what had satisfied the test of experiment before him was right. He didn't throw it out. But what was amazing was he showed that two things that were right but were inconsistent could be brought together. 
And the two things that were inconsistent was the first I just told you. Maxwell told me, and you, and all of us, that if we shake a charge, an electromagnetic wave will go out, and I can calculate the speed of that wave by measuring the strength of electricity and the strength of magnetism in my laboratory. Okay, that's Maxwell. A few hundred years before Maxwell, Galileo, the father of modern science, really, demonstrated something else, which was, again, seeing what was really there underneath the surface. Up to that point, people had argued that the natural state of all objects at rest. Aristotle argued that. He was wrong about pretty well everything, in my opinion, when it comes to natural science, at least. The because everything goes to rest. You roll something, it goes to rest. But of course, Galileo realized that was an accident of our circumstances, an accident of friction. What he showed is that if I push an object and there's no force acting on it, it'll continue to move at the same speed forever. And we can codify that in a slightly different way. What he said, and what is true, is that there's no way to tell if you're moving at a constant speed. If I'm, there's no way to know that you're moving or whether you're standing still if you're moving at a constant speed. There's just no way. We're standing still now, right? No. We're moving at 30 kilometers per second around the sun right now. Okay? 200 kilometers per second around the galaxy right now. But because we're moving at a constant speed, we don't know that. If you're, if you're at the underground, this has all happened to you at one point or another, and you're in a train, and you see the train across the way begin to move, for a second until you feel the, the bumps, you don't know if you're moving or that train's moving. And that's exactly true. If you're in an airplane, as I just was yesterday coming here, if the windows are closed and there's no turbulence, I can throw a ball up. The laws of physics are precisely the same in that airplane. There's no way I can prove that I'm moving. Absolutely no way. So that's Galileo, and that's Maxwell. Now, the brilliance of Einstein was to realize that these two correct statements were mutually inconsistent. They could not both be true at the same time if the world was a sensible place. So how did we understand that? Well, I first began to think about this when my daughter was young. So I, um, I'm going to describe it in terms of pro projectile vomit. Um, <laughs> so say I was driving my daughter to nursery school, and she wasn't very good in the car back then. Now she loves to drive. But, uh, and so I'm driving, and I'll use American units here, 20 miles per hour, safely in a nice safe zone. I'm driving. And, and, and she's in the back seat, and she projectile vomits, and it hits the back of my head. Okay? And say the projectile vomit is traveling at 10 miles per hour in the car. So in the car, the projectile vomit hits me at 10 miles per hour. But someone watching on the street laughing sees the car moving at 20 miles per hour, the projectile vomit moving at 10 miles per hour in the car. The projectile vomit is therefore moving with respect to them at, isn't this wonderful, 30 miles per hour. OK, it's a British audience. You can do simple math. OK. <laughs> now, great. But let's say my daughter is a 21st century child, and she has a laser. And she points the laser in the back of my head. I'm not going to point at you because I'll blind you. But OK. Then what happens? Well, the light travels, the laser beam travels from the back seat to the front seat at the speed of light. OK, fine. Someone on the ground watching, of course, see the laser beam go at the speed of light. But the car is going at 20 miles per hour. So the, the laser beam going with respect to them is the speed of light plus 20 miles per hour. Correct? No, no of course. That was a rhetorical question, but I knew someone would answer it. <laughs> OK. This means that Maxwell and Galileo are inconsistent. Why? Well, Maxwell tells me that if I shake a charge in this laser beam, it'll produce a light wave, which will go out at the speed of light, calculated by measuring the, speed of, the, the strength of electricity and the strength of magnetism in the car. Someone on the ground looks and sees that light ray. If the light ray is traveling at the speed of light, plus 20 miles per hour, as it sensibly should, that means the speed of light relative to them is different. But that means that the strength of electricity and the strength of magnetism for that person on the ground must be different. Because remember, the speed of light is determined by the strength of electricity and the strength of magnetism, according to Maxwell. But Galileo says, no, there's no way anyone on the ground can experience anything different in their laboratory than anyone in the car. Because that would mean the person on the ground would know that they're at rest. So there's no way that you can have different results for the strength of electricity and the magnetism on the ground as you do in the car. And that was the paradox. And of course, the only resolution of the paradox, which Einstein was brave enough to do, because he realized both Galileo and Maxwell were both correct. He didn't throw out either of them. He said the only way that can be consistent 
is if the speed of light is measured to be the same for both people. But that's crazy because the car is moving with respect to one person. And he said, how can you do that? Well, what is speed? Speed is something you measure, and that's the crucial part. The world of our experience, the world we determine, the reality of our existence is based on measurement and nothing but measurement. Well, except for the Republican Party in my country, but, but um, <laughs> measurement. And therefore, let's think about what speed is. It's distance traveled in a given time. Therefore, if different observers are going to measure the same speed, but clearly you think different distances traveled because the car is moving for one and it isn't moving for the other, then their measurements of distance and time must be subjective. Different observers will measure different distances and different times. That's the only way these two people could be consistent, Maxwell and Galileo. Okay? And so he was bold enough to assert that. And, and, and the thing I hate about the way physics is taught too often in high schools is they say Einstein postulated that the speed of light is constant, as if it's the Bible or the Constitution, and Einstein somehow liked the fact that the speed of light was constant. Not at all. He was driven to it, kicking and screaming, because it was the only way to make known physics be consistent. It wasn't something he assumed as a mathematician. It was something he was forced to as a physicist. And then, the other thing is, it wasn't just a story like religion. It makes predictions. If that was right, there were predictions. And there were three important predictions that come from that. The first is that lengths contract. That if I'm moving with respect to you, this ruler may be 10 centimeters for me, but you'll see it as 4 centimeters. And you'll say, well, that's just an illusion. It's, four, it's really 10 centimeters. It's not really 10 centimeters. It's 10 centimeters for me, but for you it is 4 centimeters. Because what is length but what you measure? And if every measurement you can make of this ruler says it's 4 centimeters, then it really is 4 centimeters. It's, it's 4 centimeters for you and it's 10 centimeters for me. It's both at the same time. Okay, Then it turns out that the, the notions of simultaneity change, that if two events happen at the same time for me, someone running with respect to me will see one event happen before the other. Okay? And then the other one, which is the staple of science fiction, is that time dilates. That if I'm moving with respect to you very fast, my clock is ticking more slowly than you, yours. And that, as I say, is a staple of science fiction because it means you can go throughout the galaxy, which would take 40,000 years if you're traveling at the speed of light if I'm watching you, but if you're on a spacecraft traveling near the speed of light, it just take a week. And it's really true. But it's not just science fiction. It's what we measure in undergraduate physics laboratories every day. And of course, at the Large Hadron Collider. And even here, you could prove it to yourself. Because if you had a Geiger counter, we detect cosmic rays called muons here. And we know where they come from. They're produced in the upper atmosphere by cosmic ray protons that collide with the atmosphere and produce these particles called muons. Muons have a lifetime of a millionth of a second. Even if they're traveling at near the speed of light, in a millionth of a second, they would go about 100 meters. But they make it down 10 kilometers because their, their clocks are ticking slowly. They say one millionth of a second time to decay, but it's, for us it's much longer, so they make it to the ground. So the very fact that we even see cosmic rays is a, is a direct evidence of the fact that time dilates. Now, the reason I tell you all this is I also prepared your mind. This is the same image I showed you from Plato. And there's a reason for that. Plato discovered that length might have a meaning for those two-dimensional observers if there was an extra dimension. And this same idea occurred to Einstein's professor of mathematics, who's one of the only professors he liked, although Minkowski didn't like him, um, who said in 1908, understood relativity in a way that Einstein hadn't, and said, henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve it an independent reality. What he meant was, I can understand that length contraction, or the changing length, the same way Plato's philosopher understood it. If the world is not three-dimensional, but four-dimensional, then when I'm moving with respect to you, Maybe I'm getting a rotated ver vision of a three-dimensional reality. And that's exactly the case. We now know we live in a four-dimensional universe. We call it Minkowski space. And the, and the mathematics is a little bit different. The rotation is a little bit more subtle. But it's really the case that when I'm moving with respect to you, I see a different slice, a different three-dimensional slice. So your space becomes my time, and my space becomes your time. 
In fact, we, the reason we can't see that is this illusion, this accident of our existence, once again having to do with light. I, take, I took a picture of all of you when Richard was talking. Okay? That picture was taken in an instant, right? No. It was spread out in space, but it was also spread out in time. Because the light from the people in the back of the auditorium left them before the light from the people in the front of the auditorium. Now, the reason I think it's an instant is just it happens to be that the speed of light is so great. But if it wasn't, we get a clear, intuitive picture of the fact that every time we look out, we're seeing a, a three-dimensional slice, a slice in space and a slice in time. And the ruler, for example, looks shorter in length, but since for you, either ends of the ruler, the clocks are tif ticking one clock behind the other. Remember, things aren't simultaneous anymore for you. So the ruler is shorter in length, but it's now spread out in time. So in four dimensions, there's a four-dimensional length we call a space-time length, and that's invariant. There is some fundamental length in the universe. Length has meaning. It doesn't have meaning for us because we are chained to the cave. We see a shadow of reality, a three-dimensional shadow of a four-dimensional universe. Okay. Next, this guy, Richard Feynman, who I've written a book about and is a great hero. Feynman gave us a different picture, our understanding of light. And don't worry, we're actually heading somewhere. You may wonder where all this is leading. But Feynman had understood electromagnetism in a new way because quantum mechanics had been developed. And quantum mechanics changed everything. Quantum mechanics told us that the world at a fundamental scale is like corporate America or Washington. If you can't see it, anything goes. Okay? The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says on small scales, you can't know everything that's happening exactly. In particular, if I measure a system for a certain amount of time, I don't know what the energy of that system is exactly, which is the reason virtual particles can pop in and out of existence. Because if I can't measure the energy, then particles of given mass can suddenly pop into existence. They violate energy conservation. But as long as they disappear on a time scale so short I can't measure it, it's possible. And what's ever possible happens. So, Feynman presented a picture of electromagnetism that was a little bit different. We, in, a, in diagrammatic form, we call it Feynman diagrams. This electron repels that electron, but the reason, it, the way it does is it emits a virtual particle, the quanta of the electromagnetic field, a photon, a particle now. And that photon, that virtual photon, which may take a little bit of energy and therefore violate energy conservation, gets absorbed here at a time scale so short you can't measure it. And that being absorbed kicks that electron away. So the repulsion is now understood as the exchange of particles. But now we can also understand why electromagnetism is long range. Because the photon has to be massless. Zero mass. Why? Because remember, if I violate energy conservation, I can only do it for a short enough time that I can't measure it. If the photon had mass, E equals mc squared, it would take a large amount of energy away, and therefore it would have to disappear very quickly. So the electromagnetic interaction would be short range, because it would have to be absorbed on short, such short, short scales that, the, that it, the interaction couldn't be long range. But because the photon is massless, it can carry an arbitrarily small amount of energy. So an electron here can emit a virtual photon that can travel to Alpha Centauri four light years away and be absorbed and carry so little energy that we can't measure the violation of energy conservation, and an electron here can repel an electron over there. So the reason electromagnetism is long range is because the photon is massless. Okay. Now, the last little bit that, that will lead us to understand why the universe on fundamental scales is so different than we think it is, is a, is a fact that I learned in high school. It surprised me. Uh, the, 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 Astrophysicist Tommy Gold was lecturing, and I learned that the neutron is radioactive. Now, this is a surprise because most of the particles that make up your body are neutrons. Okay? There are more neutrons than protons in your body. If I have a neutron here, it will decay in 10 minutes. Now, painfully for many of you, this lecture has already gone on for longer than 10 minutes. Okay, you're still around. Some of you may wish you'd decayed, but, <laughs> but, but you haven't. So what happened? A remarkable accident of existence. The neutron decays into a proton and this beta particle, which is actually an electron, another particle called a neutrino. But the interesting thing is the neutron 
weighs almost exactly the sum of the mass of the proton and electron, just a little bit more than the mass of those things. If it weighed less than their mass, it couldn't decay into them, because energy would be violated. It weighs just a little bit more, which is why it lasts 10 minutes. But the amazing thing is, when I drop it in a nucleus, what happens? It gets bound. Many of you are familiar with that idea. It gets bound, okay? And what does it mean to be bound? It means it loses energy. We're bound to the Earth because we lose energy when we fall towards it. It takes energy to get up there. So the neutron loses energy when it gets bound. But E equals mc squared. Therefore, when the neutron's inside the nucleus, it weighs not enough to decay into a proton and an electron. This remarkable accident of existence that these two things weigh almost exactly the same amount is the reason we can exist. Neutrons would be unstable and decay, and there'd be no heavy elements, no people, no life like we know it, if this remarkable accident hap didn't ha happen. This accident that looks like design. And the per first person to understand this was this remarkable physicist who's another hero of mine, Enrico Fermi, who um, was the last tr truly great nuclear physicist or particle physicist who did theory and experiment equally well. Since then, it's, the fields have become equally di difficult. And so he, he recognized this phenomena and this clearly represents a new force in nature. There's some new force. Electromagnetism doesn't turn a neutron into a proton. Some new force must exist. But that new force only operates on the size of a nucleus. We don't feel the weak force. It doesn't operate on our scale, so you may wonder why I'm wasting your time for it with it. Well, the reason is it's, it, it, oops, let's go back. It's responsible for the processes that power the sun. The weak force, which changes neutrons into protons, is the reason the sun burns. So it's, again, the reason we're here. So you should care about it. But now, physicists, physics is like Hollywood. If it works, copy it, <laughs> literally. And so we had the best theory of nature. Truly, quantum electrodynamics is the best theory we have of nature. You can make predictions of fundamental quantities and compare them to experimental observations, and they agree to 14 decimal places. There's nowhere else in all of science not just biology, but all the rest of physics and chemistry. There's nowhere else you can make such good predictions. It's the best theory. So we copy it. And so the idea is, OK, well, let's imagine that weak decay looks like that. The neutron decays into protons. It's actually made of these things called quarks, but that doesn't matter. And maybe it occurs by the exchange of a particle. But it's short range because that particle is very massive. Remember I told you if you have a massive particle, the force has to operate over a very short range. Great, so this is the theory that was presented. The problem is, it yields nonsense. There are in, it produces results that are infinite. It just doesn't work. And this is a problem, because this theory works really well. This theory is nonsense. And that was the problem that physics faced for, for almost 50 years, until we realized that we're really being myopic in a way that amazes me that we, on this random place in this random time, have discovered. And this was the fundamental discovery that changed everything. We are living inside of a superconductor. We just didn't know we were. Superconductivity was discovered, I think, in 1911 by Camerlingonis. He discovered if I cool mercury down to a certain temperature, 4.2 degrees above absolute zero, the resistance disappears. That means I can hook a battery up to a wire, made of mercury, cool it down to that, there's a current flowing, take the battery away, the current will flow forever. Not just for a little while, but forever. There's zero electric resistance, not just a little bit, but zero. That was remarkable. It took 50 years to understand that, it turned out. It turns out a very special configuration occurs within the superconducting material that creates that. But it does something very special. And you can demonstrate that nowadays with high temperature superconductors, because we can do these wonderful little experiments in classrooms where you have a high temperature superconductor and you have dry ice, and you can float a magnet above it. Why can you float a magnet above it? Because magnetic fields can't permeate a superconductor. So the magnetic fields from this magnet basically get expelled, and that levitates the magnet. OK. But what would it look like if you lived inside that superconductor? What it would it mean that electric, and it turns out electric fields can't permeate it either. If electric and magnetic fields couldn't permeate the superconductor, they would die off at a very small distance. In the superconductor, electromagnetism would be a short-range force. In a superconductor, 
photons have mass. If you lived inside of a superconductor, your laws of physics would tell you that the quanta of electromagnetism was massive. But it would be an illusion. But you wouldn't know it because you lived in the superconductor. We live in a superconductor. That was what was discovered by Mr. Higgs. If you're swimming in a pool, you can swim. If you change the pool to be molasses, you swim a lot slower. You feel a lot heavier. And what Mr. Higgs recognized is if there's an invisible field, we'll call it the Higgs field, he didn't, throughout all of space that somehow makes space a superconductor, then certain particles that interact with that field can act like they're massive, even though they're not really massive. And other particles that don't interact with that field remain massless. And then you can make another unification, the, truly the greatest unification of the 20, 20th century. Here's, a, here's that Feynman diagram I showed. Here are these other diagrams with these particles that convey the weak force. Remember, they gave infinities because these particles were massive. But if we realize at a fundamental level, those particles are actually massless, the mathematics becomes identical. And you get reasonable results. And the only reason these particles look like they're massive to us is because there's this invisible background field that we live in a superconductor, this accident of our existence. Truly remarkable, and it took the longest time for people to really understand what that meant, including Higgs, who didn't apply his ideas to this theory at all, as physicists didn't at the time. It was an accident later on that caused us to realize that. But not only is the mathematics identical, but we now realize that these two very different forces of nature are really the same force. They're different manifestations of the same force. We now call it the electroweak force. Just like electricity and magnetism were unified by Maxwell and Faraday, and space and time were unified by Einstein, electromagnetism and the weak force were unified by many physicists in this process. But the result is that we realize that truly, not only is this force an accident, but the particles in our body that have mass are an accident. Because we realize that the particles that are more massive are just interacting with this Higgs field with greater intensity. The ones that are less massive have smaller interactions with the Higgs field. And the photon, which is massless, has zero interactions with the Higgs field. So that our existence and the existence of planets and galaxies and everything we see is an accident of this Higgs field that froze in a certain configuration. Now, this is the idea. This is the Feynman diagram picture of this. So particles interact with this Higgs field, and they get bounced around, which means they move more slowly than they would otherwise, which means that they look massive. Now, this is a wonderful picture, but you will notice that it resembles religion. Because I've postulated an invisible force that's responsible for our existence. Okay? Or Star Wars, it sounds like that too. But this isn't religion. Because that postulate is fine, but it wouldn't be science if we couldn't measure the Higgs field. That's the difference. You can't measure God because God doesn't exist. You can measure the Higgs field. If you can, if it exists, you damn well better be able to measure it. Otherwise, it isn't science. And so, how can you measure the Higgs field? That was the last thing we needed to do to see if this real illusion of reality was true. And the answer is sadomasochism. As it's the answer to many things. <laughs> Spank the vacuum. Spank it hard! <laughs> because in quantum mechanics, every field is associated with a particle. And if I hit empty space hard enough at a certain point, I should kick out real particles. We'll call them Higgs particles. How can I spank the vacuum? I can build a, I, well, I just skipped this for a second. I can build a damn big machine. I could build the Large Hadron Collider, which, if you've ever been in Geneva, there's the Geneva Airport, and if you come out, you won't see anything but farmland, but underneath the farmland is the most complex machine humans have ever created. 26 kilometers long, we accelerate protons 99.99995% the speed of light in this direction, and protons at 99.99995% the speed of light in that direction. They'll go around thousands of times each second, Here's the French-Swiss border. They do without passports. They go boom, boom. And 
And they collide and produce enough energy at a single point that we thought they might produce the Higgs particle. We hoped. And on July 4th, 2012, these results were demonstrated. It became a July 4th became a real day to, de to celebrate. <laughs> there were 50-ish events that looked like Higgses. They walked like Higgses. They quacked like Higgses. We thought they were Higgses. It turns out now, and f four years later, five years later, all of the experiments tell us is consistent with the Higgs particle. We discovered the particle that was the last bastion of the standard model. My friend Shelley Glashow, who won a Nobel Prize for actually the model itself, called the Higgs the toilet of modern physics because it, it's where all the action is, but no one ever talks about it. <laughs> and, and but I want to point out, as I near the end of this, that this demonstrates for me exactly what Darwin represented for me, humanity at its best. The fact that we could search for reality independent of our biases, whether or not it takes us to where we'd like to go. We might not like that, we, that, that, that everything we see is an illusion. We might not like that we have common ancestors with great apes. But it's the way it is. And not only that, but it's humanity that's best for another reason. Here's Darwin at a different age. Here's Ro Wallace. Everyone had beards. But they were humanity at its best for another reason. Richard rightly, in my opinion, called Darwin the greatest scientist. You know, as a physicist, everyone loves Einstein. People often ask me, who was greater, Einstein and Darwin? And I rightly say, Darwin. Because not only did he produce a beautiful theoretical idea that explained everything, but he was also an observer. We can't call him an experiment. We could call him an experimentalist. He observed, as did Wallace. These men spent years of their lives collecting thousands of specimens. They didn't just talk. They acted. They saw. Their ideas were based on their own experiments that they painstakingly assembled over years. I don't think anyone in the modern world would have the patience to do what either of them did, especially Wallace and the number of, of specimens he collected over the years that he was traveling. Well, that's exactly, in some sense, the tradition we have with the Large Hadron Collider. It took over 20 years to build by 10,000 physicists from 100 different countries speaking dozens of different languages, all working together for a single purpose, to create the most complex machine that's ever been developed just to answer this esoteric question about our existence. To, to, the Gothic cathedrals were developed to celebrate the glory of God. These are the Gothic cathedrals of the 20th and 21st century. They celebrate the glory of nature. And people come together, and science unifies people independent of their, of their gender, their national background, or even their religion. Because they want to find out what's, how the world really works, not how the, they want the world to work. I have a better picture. Oh, here's, I'm in it, so it's much better. <laughs> now. Every, just to give you a sense, there's so in my book, I, I was amazed when I wrote the book, of the different superlatives that you can apply to the Large Hadron Collider. But just think of this one thing. Every second in the Large Hadron Collider, enough data is generated to fill more than 1,000 one terabyte hard drives, more than the information in all the world's libraries. Every second. It's an amazing machine. But we're not there. In fact, I'm a big fan of art. And, 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 and I love Impressionist art. And the great thing about Impressionist art is it's great unless you won't go up close and then it's really crappy. Okay? <laughs> That's the way it is with physics at the forefront. We have this beautiful picture, but why is the Higgs there? Why did it freeze the way it did? We don't know the answer. And, and I was just, when I was preparing this, I found a wonderful quote. It is no valid objection that science as yet throws no light on the for far higher problem of the essence or origin of life. Who can explain gravity? No one now objects to the following, to following out the results consequent on this unknown element of attraction. Of course, it was Charles Darwin who said that. What he said was, look, we don't know the origin of life, but that doesn't, just because we don't know everything, it doesn't mean we don't know anything. As I've often said, the ignorance is not evidence of God, it's evidence of ignorance. And so this picture we have, every time we discover something new in science, it opens up more questions. Because of course, the existence of natural selection 
naturally led to the question, what's the mechanism for natural selection? Leading ultimately to DNA and the human genome, and even still, the nature of metabolism. Every time we discover something, the world becomes a richer place. Biology is a rich place because of Darwin. Similarly, the world of physics is richer every time we make a new discovery. But the last thing I want to say is that this emphasizes this really important fact that our existence is a cosmic accident. The world, universe, even the universe of our physical laws was not designed for our existence. Because in, at its basic level, we shouldn't exist. It's just an accident. It's just like living on this icicle. Here, this, this direction was very, very special. The other directions were different. It was an accident of their existence. For us, electromagnetism is special. It's different, but it's just an accident. And we are here by cosmic natural selection. In a real way, if the Higgs field hadn't frozen the way it did, had frozen in a different configuration, we wouldn't be here. We evolved because the laws of physics allowed us to evolve, not the other way around. Exactly as we evolved because the conditions on Earth allowed humans to evolve as they did. And in a different planet, it might be very different. But I want to end with something, with a beginning. I, I, I've given two commencement addresses, and, I, and I've always wanted to start with the way this speaker started. Things are going to get unimaginably worse, and they're never, ever going to get better again. <laughs> That's the way I feel in the States right now. But, but uh, the point is, we are not only just the same as these people on this icicle, just as myopic, because our cosmic superconductor hides the reality of the universe, but we may be just as ephemeral. Because the Higgs field froze in the early universe, but it can melt. And for these people who finally discovered the laws of physics, they may not realize that the next morning the sun is going to shine. And the icicles are going to go away. The world will become much more symmetric and beautiful, but they won't exist. And it's quite possible for us that the Higgs field could disappear. And if it does, everything we see will be gone. But that's OK, too. Because once again, it's incredibly presumptuous to assume that the universe is always the same and always here for us. It's just here, perhaps, for a little while. Just like who knows what the future of evolution will be. The, the, the dominant intelligent on Earth might be silicon in a while. There's nothing, people seem to fear that, but it just may, may be the way it is. And so I want to return. By, an end by, by, with, with arm. Because, you know, I love the love, everyone loves the last lines of the words in species. Where it says, there's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. And just, I view this as exactly the, what we've talked about in science. This diverse universe has evolved from a very simple beginning, just as life has. The diversity of what we see is cosmic natural selection and cosmic evolution. But just to show that you shouldn't listen to scientists too much, Darwin also said in a letter to Hooker, it is mere rubbish thinking at present of the origin of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter. And that's exactly what we've been doing. The point is, what we imagine as unimaginable to explain today will be high school problems for, for the children of the future, if there ever still is high school. <laughs> and I find that equally remarkable. And I guess I, I wanna, I, I'm going to end with reading something that, that's from the end of my book, if you'll allow me to. I've gone on already 10 minutes longer than I would have liked, but, and maybe longer for you. But I want to read it, because I think it really and, and I'm up here, so I get to do what the hell I want. <laughs> um, because I was thinking about Darwin, and I just read this the other day. Faced with the mystery of our existence, we have two choices. We can assume we have special significance and that somehow the universe was made for us. For many, this is the most comfortable choice. It was a choice made by early human tribes who anthropomorphized nature because it provided them with some hope of understanding what otherwise seemed to be a hostile world centered on suffering and death. It is a choice made by almost all the world's religions, each of which has its own claimed solution to the quandary of existence. The second choice when addressing these transcendental questions is to make no assumption in advance about the answer, which leads to another story, one that I think is more humble. 
In this story, we evolve in a universe whose laws exist independently of our own being. In this story, we check the details to see if they might be wrong. In this story, we are going to be surprised at every turn. And that's why we're living in the greatest story ever told so far. And I began my book with the quote from Virgil. who said, these are the tears of things, and the stuff of our mortality cuts us to the heart. That's a famous quote. The next line is not as well known, but to me it's equally important because it represents Darwin at his best. Release your fear. Don't be afraid of the unknown. Don't be afraid of the fact that we're not created by some imaginary god, that we arose here through natural selection. Don't be afraid that we live in a universe that doesn't give a damn about us, but instead, enjoy your brief moment in the sun. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've been treated to a virtuoso display of science communication, wit, intelligence, knowledge, wisdom, poetry, humor. The greatest story ever told so far. I think we've just heard one of the greatest lectures I've ever heard. Well, thank you. I, I can never really claim to understand what physicists say, but I, I kind of measure the quality of a physics lecture or book by whether it advances me somewhat in the right direction, and I felt Today, I, I grasped a bit more than I usually do uh, <laughs> about <clears throat> Maxwell, about Plato, um, about all sorts of, of, of things. It's, it's been a feast. And even I, I now understand what Eric Idle meant in his puff for the, for the book, <laughs> the greatest story ever told so far. I loved the fight scenes and the sex scenes were excellent. <laughs> 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 All that spanking of the vacuum. <laughs> <laughs>